We know a lot of you value the CyberWire and that it helps you do your jobs better. And we hope you'll check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the CyberWire and become a regular supporter. Thanks. All things Equifax as the Credit Bureau deals with its breach and the lawyers and Wall Street wind up to deal with the Credit Bureau. The Chaos Computer Club says it's found major flaws in German election software. Moscow seems to have done a lot of catfishing in social media during the last U.S. campaign season. Best Buy boots Kaspersky security products from its big box stores. And a cracker with attitude gets five years in Club Fed. Time for a message from our sponsor, the good folks over at Recorded Future. You've heard of Recorded Future. They're the real-time threat intelligence company. Their patented technology continuously analyzes the entire web to give InfoSec analysts unmatched insight into emerging threats. We subscribe to and read their cyber daily. They do some of the heavy lifting in collection and analysis that frees you to make the best informed decisions possible for your organization. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email, and every day you'll receive the top results for trending technical indicators that are crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. Subscribe today and stay ahead of the cyber attacks. Go to recordedfuture.com slash intel to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. It's timely, it's solid, and the price is right. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Monday, September 11th, 2017. We begin today with some updates on last week's Equifax debacle. By general consensus, the most serious data breach to come along in years. In terms of numbers affected, it's smaller by an order of magnitude than the Yahoo breaches of 2016, but those affected mostly Yahoo user credentials. The Equifax breach, which at 143 million individuals hit is big enough, includes a great deal of sensitive personal information. Names, social security account numbers, dates of birth, and addresses. Large subsets of those individuals also had their credit cards exposed. Some 209,000 card numbers were lost. And other personal information, like driver's license numbers and records of credit disputes, was taken from 182,000 people. Once you take out children and those who don't participate in the labor market, the 143 million total, a little less than half the U.S. population, is enough to cover the vast majority of adults who would be in a position to seek credit. So anyone who has a credit card, a home loan, in many cases even a bank account, can consider themselves at risk. Much of the coverage of the breach is misleading in that it says Equifax customers were the victims of data theft but the individuals whose information was stolen were, for the most part, not customers of Equifax, but rather people whose credit Equifax was rating for the institutions that are its actual customers, banks, credit managers, and so forth. The consensus advice experts are giving to those affected, which would probably include you if you're listening to this, is to put a freeze on their credit. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission has some advice available on how to do this, which you'll find at consumer.ftc.gov. Go to the FTC's blog on the site and select the entry called The Equifax Data Breach, What to Do. Equifax incident response, particularly its public communications, have been widely exoriated. Krebs on Security calls it a dumpster fire, and that's the general assessment. The 41 days between discovery and disclosure strikes most as far too long. To be sure, it takes time to evaluate a security incident, and no one would want to send out disclosures and alerts on the basis of every wayward false positive. But it's difficult to see 41 days as falling within any reasonable standard of timely notification. Here are two benchmarks in U.S. state law and regulation that may provide context. Georgia's breach notification law reads as follows. Any person or business that maintains computerized data on behalf of an information broker or data collector that includes personal information of individuals that the person or business does not own shall notify the information broker or data collector of any breach of the security of the system within 24 hours following discovery if the personal information was or is reasonably believed to have been acquired by an unauthorized person. 
and New York State's Department of Financial Services in its regulations that began to come into effect at the end of last month gives covered entities no more than 72 hours to report once they've determined that a cybersecurity event has occurred. Security experts are already reporting a spike in online fraud of the kind normally associated with such breaches. One bit of dark web criminal activity that popped up within hours of Equifax's disclosure has, however, begun to appear bogus. A ransom message appeared from some person or persons claiming to be the Equifax hacker. They said, We need to monetize this information as soon as possible, and demanded 600 bitcoin from Equifax, roughly $2.5 million, by September 15th. If the credit bureau failed to pay, the authors of the ransom note said they'd post the stolen data, minus the credit card numbers, online. But these people, whose accounts have been suspended by their hosts, appear to be opportunistic grifters and not the real hackers after all. Investigation continues. Speculation about how the hackers got in centers on an Apache Struts vulnerability, although which vulnerability and how it may have been exploited remains unclear. Equifax's stock price continues to drop. It fell more than 13% Friday. This afternoon, it's down by about 10%. The share prices of its two principal competitors, Experian and TransUnion, also took an initial tumble Friday but appear to be recovering today. States' attorneys general, including New York's, are opening investigations, as are the U.S. Congress and any number of regulatory bodies. The plaintiff's bar is also predictably queuing up legal action against Equifax. HackRead reports the suits add up to billions, as one would expect. Even though such large awards of damages are unlikely, Equifax faces some tough legal sledding over the incident. The Chaos Computer Club, a white hat outfit operating from Germany, reports finding vulnerabilities in voting software used in several German lender. The Federal Republic's 16 constituent states will hold elections on September 24th. Berlin has been preparing for Russian interference for a year. Facebook's discovery that it had been selling ads to Russian catfish prompts a look by the New York Times and others at one prominent influence operations tactic, the creation of fictitious persona in social media. These were evidently used to cast doubt on the integrity of U.S. political institutions during the last election cycle. Disruption and mistrust were apparently more important than any particular balloting outcome. Kaspersky Lab remains in bad official U.S. odor. It's also taken a hit in the consumer marketplace, as Best Buy announces it will no longer carry the Russian security company's products. And finally, remember the crackers with attitude who doxed various U.S. government officials back in 2015? The second cracker to cop a guilty plea has been sentenced. Justin G. Liverman, age 25, who used the nom de hack default, has received five years in the big house on a federal hacking beef. Time to share some information from our sponsor, Silence. We've been following WannaCry, Petya, Not Petya, and other forms of destructive ransomware for weeks. Silence would like you to know that they can prevent Petya-like ransomware from executing in your system, and they'd also like you to know that they've been doing that since October of 2015. How's that for getting ahead of the threat? Their success against Not Petya demonstrates the benefits of their temporal predictive advantage. Silence Protect stops both file and fileless malware. It runs silently in the background. And best of all, it doesn't suffer from the blind spots in legacy defenses that NotPetya exploited to such devastating effect. If you don't have Silence Protect, and if you'd like to learn more about how it can defend your enterprise, contact them at Silence.com and find out how their AI-driven solution can predict and prevent the unknown unknowns from troubling you. And we thank Silence for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Dale Drew. He's the Chief Security Officer at Level 3 Communications. Uh, Dale, welcome back. You know, you all have uh, a really unique view of the Internet. There's a lot of things that you all can see that many organizations cannot. And you wanted to share some uh, pretty sobering statistics with us today. Yeah, sobering is a very good word for it. We have this threat intelligence infrastructure that we use to monitor for traffic on our network, and we categorize attacks uh, that that we see. And so, and what we've seen is a pretty sharp 
and sustained increase in uh, attacks going through the public internet. And so two things which are, which were pretty surprising. The one is we, on a rolling average 30-day basis, we see about 750,000 automated attacks a day uh, hitting the honeypot uh, network. These are machines that are set up. We have them. Other companies have them. We sort of monitor the honeypot networks. Against victims, we see 15,000 malware sessions a second uh, hitting victims. And so the amount of malware traffic on the global uh, backbone is just staggering. We see 50,000 phishing emails a second. So these are emails going to to potential victims to have them click on it so that they can get their computer compromised to have malware delivered uh, and then gets access to the enterprise. And we see about 8,000 scanning attempts per second. And these are bad guys automatically scanning the network looking for particular exposures that they then uh, can compromise to deliver uh, things like malware. So, you know, attacks are are definitely uh, here to stay and they're definitely growing. There, there was a study or a survey produced by Encapsula here not too recently that said about that uh, 52% of all web traffic is botnet traffic. And of that uh, web traffic, about um, 23% of it was helpful botnet traffic, like um, oh, search engine traffic and feed fetching traffic. Hmm. And about 29% of it was harmful botnet traffic, automated systems that are scanning and looking for victims, compromising them, adding them to botnets. And so just on botnet, just on web traffic alone, more than 50% of all uh, web traffic was surveyed to be botnet traffic. So looking at these numbers, uh, what's a person to do? What are your recommendations? <laughs> well, my recommendation is bad guys are here to stay. Hmm. Bad guys are, are have automated their infrastructure, so they don't have to have you know fingers on the keyboard uh, at all times to be able to find your weaknesses, exploit those weaknesses, and gain access to your infrastructure. So at level three, our public infrastructure gets scanned six times a second. You know, we audit our infrastructure every day. I, so I'm auditing my systems every 24 hours, but the bad guys are looking for weaknesses every six seconds. And so the moment that we have a, a weakness in our infrastructure, uh, an operator uh, makes a, a small configuration change uh, or forgets to deploy a patch in time, I'll find it in 24 hours. The bad guys will find it within six seconds. And so our our diligence um, to make sure that if you have infrastructure connected to the public internet and it's accessible, to make sure that you have the right practices in place to monitor not only for compliance of um, security policy and patches, but also more importantly to monitor for potential breaches and compromises. All right, sobering indeed, uh, but always as always, good information. Dale Drew, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, check out Silance.com. If you find this podcast valuable, we hope you'll consider becoming a contributor. You can go to patreon.com slash the CyberWire to find out how. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.